House Bill 1020 looking different yet again. We'll break down the changes and how they could impact you. We could use a break from the severe weather and we're actually going to get one for a couple of days. Then another chance for storms. Full details coming up. Three on your side. WLBT News at 6 starts now. It's going to be a long haul. Day four of tornado cleanup continues in our state and plenty of work still needs to be done. It does. The statewide response focusing on getting rid of debris and making sure people have clean water to drink. Now the National Weather Service is now confirming that seven tornadoes hit the state Friday. That massive EF4 tornado hit Sharkey County where we learned today that at least 255 homes are damaged. Two of the other tornadoes rated EF3 in strength, nearly 1900 homes damaged and that number could still go up. Now our team coverage continues tonight from Sharkey and Carroll counties. Holly Emery begins our coverage from Rolling Fork to show you how much debris uh, still needs to be removed. Howard, for reference, I'm 5'3", and these are the types of piles that have been pushed out throughout the county. And this is just debris of stuff getting off of the road. And these piles are about six feet, if not more, tall. Piles six feet or more tall with wrecked homes, destroyed vehicles, and more. And it's steps like this that emergency officials say are necessary for recovery to happen. A long road ahead for the residents of Rolling Fork as everyone pitches in for recovery efforts. We're transitioning right now from response during the night of the, the uh, incident to the recovery phase at, at this point. We're trying to bring people back to some type of normalcy during the recovery phase. Right now, emergency management directors from around the state are helping Sharkey County develop goals for the coming weeks and beyond. We help the Board of Supervisors get back on track to make sure this community is resilient. Uh, their short-term goals we're looking at for is debris removal, uh, making sure the piles are restored, and also the individual assistance, making sure these individuals are getting help that they need from FEMA. Sharkey County EMA Director Frank Eason says contracts have been approved by the board to allow companies to come in and work on clearing properties and restoring power to the community. Next up for completion, health and emergency services. Right now, the clinics are open, but we're in the process of bringing our hospital back up. Uh, I would say five to 10 days, we should have a, a viable hospital uh, at our civic center. Their EOC was small, it was inside the, located inside the sheriff's office, which received some damage. We got with the hospital and they allowed us to use this location here, which we can expand our EOC and bring in more people, more experts to help throughout this process. But as county and city officials work to restore the town, storm victims need temporary assistance as well. And that's where FEMA comes in. We're really here to address those immediate needs. So temporary housing, getting personal property loss potentially replaced, maybe even paying a deductible for a car um, that may have been lost or damaged. If you are affected by the storms on the 24th and the 25th, please apply. As for how long this will take to clean up all of this meth, uh, mess, uh, officials say that all of it could take years before any full restoration can happen. Now let's send it over to three on your sides, Chris Fields in Carroll County with a heartbreaking tale of a family who has experienced loss. Now this is what remains of what used to be the home of the Munford family. Now all that's left are cinder blocks and damaged vehicles in the driveway. Now unfortunately their home blew away during the tornado, killing them, killing a the mother, a father, and a son, and leaving their twin son severely injured. When LaShonda Hemfield Jeriff got the alarming news. I, I, I think I fainted. I remember my youngest daughter coming in there asking me what's wrong, checking on me because I got the call that they couldn't locate them. But before she could make it to Carroll County, she got the call. And then I got the call back to saying that, hey, they found all three of them deceased and I was devastated. The victims are identified as 54-year-old Helen Mumford, 51-year-old Danny Mumford, and their 14-year-old twin son, Jadarian Murphy, all three killed during the storm. The other twin son remains severely injured. Family members say the strong tornado picked up the mobile home and tore it into pieces, leaving behind miles of debris. Helen was my first cousin. Our moms were sisters. Danny was her husband. And Jadarian was their 14-year-old. He was a, a twin. 
Um, they lost their life during the storm. One of the twins managed to uh, survive. He's mentally not there. Um, he has broken bones, but he's still alive here with us. So we're still trying to process the fact of losing three family members at one time and extremely close family members. Um, they were the life of the family. They were the, the cooks of the family. They just kept the family together, sir. Those I spoke with say the family land has been around for more than 60 years. Now, most of the homes on the property are either blown away or severely damaged. Debris in what used to be personal belongings scattered out in the field. This is the first time that we've had anything close to this, sir. If you look around, we can't even imagine, you know, how we're going to pick up the pieces and rebuild, sir. It's going to be very difficult. Federal emergency assistance is what the family says they desperately need right now. Now, GoFundMe has been created to help bury their three loved ones at GoFundMe.com, and it's called Hope for the Henfields. For now, that's the very latest here in Carroll County. Chris Fields, three on your side. So heartbreaking. Together, we can help everyone get through this disaster, though. That's why WLBT is partnering with the Salvation Army for our Mississippi Strong Tornado Relief Drive. Text MS Tornadoes to the number on your screen to donate, and 100% of your money will go to help the victims. We need a break. We're getting a break, a much needed one out there right now. I just want to show you this radar. There's nothing on it across our area. Live first alert Doppler radar shows things are quiet. Earlier showers that happened across our southernmost counties are now in the Gulf of Mexico. And in fact, as far as rainfall goes, we had anywhere from one to three inches of rain across the southern counties very early this morning, two, three, four, five o'clock in the morning. Most of the showers then exited on out, and now we're left with just a few high clouds out there. Partly sunny skies, temperatures in the 60s and 70s, Macomb 71, Jackson at 68 degrees. Power outages were down a little bit now. 5,000 customers statewide, but as our weather it looks pretty good for tonight, we could be looking at more storms later this week. I've got details on that coming up. Your elected officials will be in Jackson a little longer than first planned. They still haven't agreed on a budget and there are controversial bills left to handle like House Bill 1020. Here's the latest. Okay, 1020 is no different than any other bill that's filed in the legislative process. It starts in one way, um, it goes through the public scrutiny. Uh, and it hopefully improves. You've seen the public outcry for various pieces of House Bill 1020. Now a conference report is filed and it looks different from the other versions you've seen. The only conferee from Jackson, Earl Banks, previously said he was waiting on a conference meeting, so we asked if he ever got that. Did the six of you ever sit down at the same time? No, no, never, never. Never at all. We've all met at different times. So. Meeting logistics aside, let's get into the changes. Some deleted elements are back in slightly different ways. They're now proposing creating a new court for the Capitol Complex Improvement District with an appointed judge and prosecutors. Because you have the CCID, it's basically effectively a municipal court. And all across the state, that's what municipal courts do. They handle your preliminary matters or they handle your traffic laws and things like that. And so that's where that, that came from. The municipal court system that would be set up, municipal court system that we've set up, those funds will go to the city of Jackson, not to Hines County, nor to the state of Mississippi. From a policing perspective, the CCID lines would be expanded, but not quite as far north as first proposed. And who responds? Capitol Police, uh, only within the CCID, will have primary jurisdiction. And in outside of the CCID, uh, JPD will have primary jurisdiction and they'll work together in each other's areas. An accountability piece was added that would require a public hearing every quarter for you to express any concerns or ask questions. So we're still working on the conference report. I expect a, um, a final version within the next day or so. Now remember, this is not a done deal. It has to be voted on by both the House and Senate again, so expect more debate. Now, some of you are beginning to wonder if your trash here in Jackson will be picked up next week. The city's contract with its current garbage provider will expire in just three days. No other company is set to take the reins at this point. Three on your side, Brendan Hall speaks with residents about their concerns. Brendan? Howard, for the most part, the people I spoke to say they don't care what company is picking up their trash as long as it's being picked up. But unfortunately, right now, even that's in question. 
Tuesday morning, all the trash cans along Riverwood Drive were empty. A woman who lives on the street says three days from now, she hopes that's still the case. I'm concerned. But the reality is all Jackson residents are left with no choice but to wonder what will happen if it's not. It's going to be chaos. Can you imagine uh, trash all littering all over Jackson? No one to clean it up. The city's emergency contract with its current trash collector, Richard's Disposal, is set to expire on March 31st, with no one waiting in the wings to take over. Monday, the Jackson City Council president claimed the ball is in the mayor's court to bring a new option to the council and one that can get a majority vote. The mayor, meanwhile, says he stands with the conclusions of the evaluation process, which determined Richard's was the top vendor. Amid all this back and forth, residents say they've been lost in the shuffle. This is a ridiculous situation between the city council and the mayor. It's embarrassing for the city, which doesn't need any more embarrassment. I'm just not understanding why is is why they can't work together. If they're all here for the for the same common goal, then it, we shouldn't have the conflict. Uh, the people are the one that's that's suffering, really. Some say they'd like the city to stick with Richards. Others say they'd like to go back to waste management. Everyone says they just want their trash picked up. We shouldn't have to go through this. No, it's ridiculous. It's trash pickup. It's part of what we pay our taxes for. Again, the last day of Richards Disposal's contract is Friday. As of now, no meeting has been scheduled between the mayor and council to hash out the future of trash pickup here in the capital city. Brendan Hall, three on your side. Guns on airplanes? You wouldn't believe how people have been trying to do that all around the country and right here in Mississippi. Here from federal officials, Jackson's Megan Wiley Evers International Airport. WWT News that was headed that way and take, you know, take shift. And that's what we, me and my lady, we did. Channel 3 all the time. And uh, it's right to the point. When it said go, go. Went to the Jackson Airport this morning to discuss your safety. Three on your side, Joseph Doring joins us now to break down those details. Joseph? Courtney Ann Howard, it's not every day that you simply forget that you left your gun in the duffel bag you're about to use as your carry-on bag for a flight. But even if it's an honest mistake, it poses a, a severe risk to everyone around you at an airport and can have irreversible consequences. Tip number one for, for travels, no guns and carry-on. Firearm must be in a check baggage. That sounds pretty easy to follow, right? Well, maybe, but thousands of people didn't last year. And by not doing so, TSA confiscated an all-time record 6,542 guns last year that were brought through their checkpoints, with 75 of them coming from Mississippi. The display here with the guns gives an example of all the things that our TSA officers had had to address. But they also, based upon the things that have been described this morning, are situations that are very avoidable. Just like Jermica Fomby of the Mississippi FBI just said, traveling with a gun is very avoidable if you know how. You need to declare your gun each time you fly, as well as get it checked as its own item. It needs to be unloaded and boxed in a hard-sided container. And if you don't follow those basic steps, Kim Jackson with Mississippi TSA says there will be consequences. Don't let bringing a gun to a federal checkpoint be a reason you cannot answer no to the question often asked on a job application. Have you ever been arrested? On top of hurting your reputation, Jackson says you could end up paying a $15,000 fine regardless of if you are arrested or not. And if you have TSA pre-check, Jackson says that could be permanently revoked too. So, the next time you fly, make sure you double check your bag for not only guns, but also for any other items that could be deemed dangerous to others around you. Now, as it stands right now, Mississippi has 14 confirmed firearm cases this calendar year, which is below the state average from last year. Joseph Doring, three on your side. Startling to think about, but yeah, sure glad is. that they're catching this, folks. Mm -hmm. So we're going to switch gears right, right now and find out what is happening with our weather now, Dave. Yeah, we're finally going to get some better weather for a couple of days at least. Mm -hmm. I've got some new information to share with you on the South Delta tornado. This thing was on the ground one hour and 11 minutes. The path again, 59 miles 
an EF4, 170 mile per hour winds. I've got another threat for severe weather on the way for this week, and we could be flirting with 90 degrees next week. Details coming up. Spring savings are happening now at Tillman Furniture. Get this four-piece queen bedroom set for only $73 per month. This two-piece sofa and love seat for only $103 per month. Choose a sideboard for only $62 per month. Or take advantage of Tillman's 12-month no- Looking the Jackson skyline there. Temperatures made it today to 74 degrees in Jackson. It's pretty close to normal for this time of year. Right now, we've got mostly sunny skies. This renaissance at Colony Park, 67 in Ridgeland, 68 Jackson, Canton at 60. 66 Florence 69 and currently 65 degrees in Raymond. We've got mostly sunny skies out there. Clouds are starting to move on out. These are just some high clouds around, but they're going to be around for much of this evening. Don't forget, we got a five planet alignment going on in the sky this evening. You got to check it out, though. Very shortly after sunset between 7 and 8 p.m. Look close to where the moon is located in the sky. If you can get away from some of these clouds. Otherwise, we're updating you on power outages. We're playing around that 5000 uh, person customer. I should say count in the state of Mississippi about 5,000 customers currently without power. Nice weather around here tomorrow, Thursday, and really most of Friday. But towards Friday evening, here comes the next weather maker. This is going to be Friday evening. Showers and thunderstorms are likely. Saturday weather improves. Sunday looks pretty decent too. Uh, but Monday and Tuesday, more showers and storms are coming back into the picture around here. Now, the next severe weather threat is really going to be focused somewhere between St. Louis and Memphis, but we're going to be on the fringes of it and close enough where we do have a two in effect. That is a slight risk for severe weather come late Friday and very early on Saturday. So the next threat we're thinking is sometime between 5 p.m. on Friday and 2 a.m. Saturday morning. The damaging wind threat is up there. The tornado risk is low. The flash flood potential also low, but there is a potential for some large hail in this system as well. Let's talk more about this tornado threat. It's a lower end threat. Certainly not much is going to happen probably through about 5 p.m. Friday. We're looking at yellows and reds here on the screen, and they do start to develop as we get into the evening around or just after sunset on on Friday. We're going to be watching very closely to see if our weather does flare up. That is also going to be true through about midnight or so. And thereafter, going into Saturday, rapidly that threat just disappears by sunrise Saturday morning. So chances for rain are there, not for the next couple of days, but every day for the next 10 days beyond that. Yeah, we're going to be looking at a good chance for showers and thunderstorms out there. Rainfall looks like this over the next seven days or so, somewhere under an inch of rain. So we're not expecting a lot of rain at all from the next system. And in fact, right now we're at five inches for the month of March. About normal for this time of the month and year. And you can see since the 1st of January, we've had over 17 inches of rainfall. Could we be 90 degrees next week? Uh, it's a possibility. A big surge in warmer temperatures is setting up across the midsection of the country. It's moving our way. If we don't reach it Tuesday or Wednesday, we may have another chance by the end of next week. Your forecast, by the way, looks like this for tonight. It's going to be a little chilly out there. Uh, just a few clouds around temperatures winding up in the mid 40s by morning. Day planning forecast for tomorrow shows you a mix of clouds and sunshine 60 at noon. Keep that jacket handy tomorrow. We're probably only going to be in the upper 60s. Don't forget tornado relief is ongoing between WLBT and the Salvation Army text. MS tornadoes to 51555 to get the latest information on how you can help. Temperatures will be in the 60s tomorrow, back to the 70s Thursday, Friday, and on into the weekend. Friday looks unsettled. Not so bad this weekend. More showers and storms Monday and Tuesday as things heat up next week. Old Miss and Southern Miss baseball meeting tonight at Trustmark Park. I'll have a look at this game coming up after the break. I'm bringing good luck to everyone. Our customers are lucky every day at Bob Boyd Honda. Spread the charm in a new Accord for 3.9% financing, or sprinkle a little holiday magic in a new Pilot for only 3.9% financing. You're gonna for time this season. Now things a little bit different for this meeting than it was last time, as neither team is ranked in the top 25 anymore. The Rebels are 0-6 to start SEC play, getting swept by two top five teams in Vanderbilt and Florida. Golden Eagles are just three and three in the Sun Belt, and right now we are in the bottom of the second. Southern Miss is up one nothing. Proud to, to represent you know our great state of Mississippi. We're honored to be here today, and and thankful for the recognition. Thank you so much. 
The Rebels championship team was honored today at the Capitol in both the House and the Senate. Head coach Mike Bianco was there along with players C.J. McCants, Peyton Chatagnier, Camp Alderman, Hunter Elliott, and Jacob Gonzalez. Now, one of the biggest questions is who will start under center this year for Ole Miss football? Jackson Dart is the incumbent starter. The junior started 13 games for the Rebs last season, but he'll be competing against Oklahoma State transfer Spencer Sanders, who has 43 starts and nearly 10,000 passing yards under his belt, and LSU transfer Walker Howard, who played in just two games for the Tigers last year, but was one of the top recruits in the country coming out of high school. But Dart sees this as his job to lose. I had year one and I kind of established myself, um, have year two and, and kind of just getting, you know, more bonds with the guys on the team, um, being a leader. Um, so I, I feel like I've taken ownership of that and, you know, I'm just ready to do my job and, you know, I'm loving where I'm at right now. So um, I just, you know, expect myself to have a great spring and keep performing the way that I'm performing and, uh, yeah, excited to help this team win. I'll have highlights for this game coming up tonight at 10. For now, I'll send it back to the studio. See you back here at 10. Join us.